I'm Jenna Wortham. I'm a journalist, podcast host, author of the forthcoming anthology Black Futures, and a current resident at 20 Summers here in P-Town. And today I'm talking with my dear friend, Naima Green, artist, photographer, and longtime collaborator, which I like saying now, because it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> How are you today? I'm so good. I am, I'm a little tired, but I feel really energized by the work I've been doing the past couple of days. So I've had some really long shoot days yesterday and the day before, but you know, we talked yesterday and you said to me, remember this was the vision for your life. And I kind of, for a moment that this is and was the vision for my life a few years ago. What um, is that vision? What is coming to life right now? When we met, I was teaching. I was teaching high school and I was teaching middle school visual arts and I love it. And, but also knew that I wanted to focus more on my own work and my practice and really give the work my full time and energy and commitment. And yeah, and so I left my teaching job in life and went back to school and became a full-time freelancer. And that first year was, I mean, so hard. Yeah. So hard. I, I, I don't think, I don't think we talk about it enough. I don't think freelancers talk about it enough, how hard it is. And I was so used to having um, a stable, you know, my teaching job as mm -hmm. having all my other projects, you know, have that come on the side and, um, or around teaching or could do it because of teaching or could fund it because of teaching. And, um, and then that shift to like, this is, this is all that you're doing and this is how you have to figure out how to make it work. And, um, and, and it still is hard, but there are so many, it's definitely gotten a lot easier and there are so many beautiful, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to move to Mexico city. I, my work takes me around the world and around the country and to places I love. And I just feel so, and landscapes I love. And I just feel so, fortunate to be able to be in places that I that I thrive in and that I love to be in so Friday that was coming back to the city and, and going to Reese and yesterday it was um, I'm in upstate New York right now so yesterday I was about an hour away in a town called Woodridge New York and just the changing colors and there was this gorgeous pond and the land was so lush and beautiful and I realized how much I thrive in those landscapes too even as a city city girl and you know wanting to leave New York and then recognizing that it's necessary for me to have a break and also to have a visual break I feel like my eyes needed mm. to um yeah how has your how has your time been <laughs> Oh my gosh, you've been getting all the voice notes, all the updates, all the pictures of seafood. Um, <laughs> yeah, bike ride. I just bought a lobster today from this place called Max and um, I, I hope I can cook it later. I haven't, I don't know, I haven't been wanting to, you know, engage too much because I just feel so, so overwhelmed. And so I haven't wanted to, to get, engage with meat too much. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens. I'll keep you posted tonight. What happens with me in this lobster that I've named Buddy as in, sorry, Buddy, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but I resonate with what you're saying about stimulation and, and sensory overload or, or what I hear you saying about it, which is I think that when I'm in a landscape that is slower, my mind can kind of almost do more. Like I can take in more or I can process more but, you know, but I love, I can operate at such a high frequency that when I'm in New York, like, I'm just like, you know, and I, I kind of get off on that. Like, it makes me feel so alive, so embodied and just so tuned in. And I think I feel a lot of gratitude for the community of thinkers and writers, intellectuals that we're all a part of. And 
I think that was always my hope for my life to be kind of in community with people I really respect and feel inspired by who inspire me. And, you know, we're so lucky we have that. Um, but taking a step back and being in a natural landscape helps so much. And, you know, when I got here, I went on an herb walk and I found all this goldenrod, which is this, you know, it looks like a weed, but it's everywhere here and all around actually the country. Yeah, we are here too. Is it, have you been harvesting any? A little bit and I've been using, but I've been using it in baths. Yeah. yeah, I made that a little seltzer water with um, mm -hmm. lemon and some of the dried goldenrod that I'm having. Um, and I'll process the, the rest when I get back to Brooklyn. But I think, um, yeah, I feel like being next to the sea, you know, like I can process the grief around the news around Breonna Taylor. You know, I can sit with the thoughts versus if I were in Brooklyn and bed I might be like, I can't deal with that and deal with the chaos of, of adapting to whatever this next phase of, of pandemic and quarantine is. So, so being here really does just allow me to kind of drop in in a different way. And I've been sleeping a lot. My dreams are really out of control, mm -hmm. totally out of control. Um, but it also feels great because I'm going to bed so early and then just waking up early so naturally. So, and the light is so beautiful up here too so i wish we were together i wish you were up here yeah. too but we'll one nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but really that nervous system reset yeah is so critical especially right now i think even in you know i i am feeling everything so intensely but what has been so beautiful about this week is that I can say, actually, fuck it, I'm not doing any work today. I'm gonna go to Poets Walk and I'm gonna get lost in the woods for three hours and I'm just going to be outside and I'm going to turn off my phone or I'm going to walk away from the computer because I've been finding myself almost reverting back to kind of my April stages of quarantine where the insomnia is coming back and so, I'm really not trying to go back to, and, and you know, I mean, I feel like I just didn't sleep for months and I didn't sleep well and I didn't rest for a really long time. And so some of those things are coming back and I'm trying, you know, everything in my power to really find the, the ease of the day to day mm -hmm. in the way that I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that are bringing you comfort right now? like mm. if you're eating or looking okay. the past few days um we got a beautiful bundle of sage from the csa and so i've been drinking tea mm -hmm. and yeah. that's been really great um i don't know what it's doing for me but it feels good whatever whatever <laughs> it is it's clear it's clarity like sage is really good for mental clarity yeah so i'm i'm feeling that um I've been eating just a lot of fresh, I mean, I've been eating a ton of delicious apples from, there's this farm stand I love called Montgomery Orchards. And um, there's a, another orchard called Rose Hill Farm and they just started a tap house. And so I've been drinking a lot of delicious cider and eating fresh, freshly picked apples and lots of fresh greens and that cheese I sent you a voice note about. The, that or I about the cheese. <laughs> so good. Find the name and so you can share it later. But yeah, I've been I've been taking in a lot of land and giving myself the break of just sitting on a bench for three hours and looking out at a vista. So I'm like, how profoundly beautiful mm. is that um and walking so much and just taking off my shoes and running around in the grass and yeah and trying there is there is also a very particular type of person that lives in upstate new york that you know encountered in, in some ways and really feeling um like I'm doing so much better at, at not holding on to any of the energy 
um, or any of the, yeah, just, just re reminding myself that I don't have to hold all the energy that is around me. And I think that okay, I do that, not, not always on purpose, um, but the purposeful act is the one of saying like, oh, that doesn't belong to me. I don't need that. I don't, and I can, I can let that go. Yeah, those boundaries are so important right now too. And I, I find myself exercising that on social media too, where it's really kind of inspired by you though, because you, in the course of knowing you, you've taken such big breaks from Instagram and Twitter. And I remember once saying to you, like, you were just like, I just deactivated. And I was like, and, and then what happens? Like, <laughs> what do you get it all back? Like, I was so, I was like, so I cannot fathom doing that. And I find myself now just like deleting all the apps off my phone and in it's in a way because I'm not in proximity in the in the way you're you're talking about in Kingston but I do feel that desire to do this sometimes like I don't want to have certain psychic energies or thoughts or be caught up in everyone else's energetic spiral mm -hmm. um or you know whatever's going on it's not always necessarily other people's anxiety but just whatever's happening it's like I kind of have to build a little safe room for my house um well i meant to say myself but my house i am a house as well me um but i need a little safe room so i'm just you know protected and cannot engage you know like just be mindful of what's coming in and letting it slide off because otherwise it's just too much right now i think it's yeah. so much it's so much in so many different ways mm -hmm. and so it's not like oh it's just this one stimuli that i can move over to the side for a little bit you know it's just like a constant i i'm just feeling overstimulated in in all of the ways yeah uh, but then also in and i do take hard breaks from social media because i do find that it really it messes with my mood in a lot of ways but also recently i've been i feel like my work i keep returning to work that i probably haven't even shared yet but just to remind myself of the different worlds that are that we can create through our work and i think about how you know how visual your language is and the ways that text and photography and writing and photography are so similar in, in a lot of different ways. And I was reminded of that when I was reading your proposal again and just thinking of the ways that the language creates such such a strong image in, but also like a sensorial experience too. Mm. And so I find myself sometimes right now, which could be the cause of my insomnia, but turning to Instagram more mm -hmm. um, and just wanting to see because there is, there is a lot, I feel like people are also right now prioritizing sharing a lot of black joy and ways that we can find rest. And so it's that coupled with, oh, I don't know what I might scroll into that could be really thing, but trying to find that balance of what feels good and I think if I didn't really have to exist and I don't have to exist on Instagram but there is a part of me that doesn't fully believe that and I think if I didn't if I really believed it I wouldn't be on it and I wouldn't be social media except for all the, the Twitter things that bring me so much joy like babies eating and like you know TikToks that are hilarious but all the jokes have those corners you know without having spill or run off from other things. Something I've always wondered too is as a visual artist, yeah, I wonder about does Instagram or any other super visual platform, does it shape how you approach your work when it's, I was gonna say analog, but that's, you know, you could be photographing digitally, but you know what I mean? Like, does it, is there an impact or an influence or do you, are you mindful of trying not to see how other artists are working visually so you can preserve your own or is it more like you know cumulative based on what you're looking at yeah i don't think so i think that i because what i've 
gotten really confident in knowing is that I have such a unique style and voice. And so yeah. I don't feel like they're, I don't feel like I'm easily influenced by other people's styles in that way. And I think it's mostly about um, really being excited for my peers and like seeing what they're up to and kind of like, oh, that cover that Dana did for Time is stunning. And I'm so excited to see that work or, you know, Giancarlo and like, you know, just, just thinking about the way other artists are working and recognizing like, oh, they, we all have such distinct, I think, visions right now. And so that is really nice to see. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't feel like I'm influenced in that way. It's more about like, what's happening? Like, what are people mm -hmm. looking at right now? Or how are you shooting this type of person? Or um, I don't know, like someone might have switched into working in color and I've only seen a lot of their black and white work or, mm -hmm. so it's more about mood boarding, I think, rather than having any worry or having any feeling that I might be persuaded to do something, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but sometimes it just feels like too much visual stimuli. Mm -hmm. And so about if I, or I, you know, I really, I think I walk away from it when I'm heavily focused on like ideating a new project or wanting to figure out what where I want to go with some sort of visual idea or identity of something. So then it's sometimes helpful to be on apps. That's like, oh, I really like this image and I could pull this element from this image or I really like the way they used a backdrop here. Or, I really like the way that this makeup was applied. You know, it can be such small things from like, oh, I love those lashes to mm. this lighting strategy or, you know, and it's always coming together you never know kind of what it will turn into when I am like turning it on my own work, if that makes sense. That makes sense. It's like, I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's just like hearing an element in a song or seeing a palette in a film that sparks something in your own mind that then you kind of take in, but it's still through your own lens and through your own, you know, and, but I, I think what you're saying about knowing the self really helps because I think it's really hard to engage a lot on social media because you're just awash in so many other people's externalized ideas that if you don't have your own, it can be really difficult to stay adrift or like keep your head above that mm -hmm. um, pile. Or you kind of I jump don't. into mm -hmm. everyone else's style, you know, which I think if you are like early on and starting out, like, yes, try as many things as possible. And then you figure out what you land on or what feels good. And I think, I mean, I think even now I feel like I'm in a place where I experiment a lot more and I get, I'm looser with my own vision. Cause I think for a while I was like very, I was very focused on a particular type of aesthetic and now I'm feeling very comfortable or the past few years just feeling really comfortable shaking up my own idea of what it might be or become or might look like and something I mean the reason I love photography so much is that I am showing up blind most of the time to the person I'm with or the space that I'm encountering and so I have to work on the fly in a way that feels really good to me and that keeps it really exciting for me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I imagine is similar for you too. showing up to a space and maybe even reporting or even thinking about the landscape that you're in and what herbs are around and how that might influence what you're making or what you're consuming or what you're thinking about in a space. Definitely. Definitely. I remember specifically when I was younger and trying to evolve out of just being a reporter into more of a critical thinker and a writer and feeling really overwhelmed and intimidated by, by reading other people's work and like I'll never have my own style but after just like you know continuing to practice and experiment and I, I just trust that I have the tools like I can just show up and the work will come and I think I have a lot more 
patience and grace for myself now to know that, um, yeah, it just, it's a process and it takes a lot of time. And, you know, I've been working a little bit this week on a collaborative essay with Kimberly, Kimberly Drew, who's my co-editor for Black Futures. And it's so funny because in the doc, I was like, I'm just going to delete like 800 words it was of my own writing. And she was like, no. And I was like, it's, po it's like garbage pasta. I kept saying, I was like, it's just garbage. Like it's, it's word soup. It doesn't, I wrote it knowing it'd probably get deleted, but sometimes it's just getting to the other side. And I think a few years ago, it would, it would have been debilitating to write something so informed in the company of someone whose opinion and mind I really respect. Whereas, you know, like, this week, it's it's very clear to me that this is not the sum yet of what this will be. So it felt okay to just practice in public a little bit. And that's something I feel proud of because that's a new skill, not one that I've always had. Um, and so it does show up like when I keep coming back to an idea or something that I'm interested in writing about, like the body, you know, or um, I don't know, sex and sexuality. It's like, you don't, have to know exactly what it will be, but now I just trust that it'll get somewhere interesting. And even if no one ever sees it or it never goes anywhere, it's, I'm answering a question for myself. And I think it shifted for me too. And there's this book I love called Black Women Writers by Claudia Tate. And she, it's such an incredible anthology. And I don't know, like I want that book every year, but she interviewed all these incredible Black women authors like Gloria Naylor, my Angelou, Alexis DeVoe, who's a you know particularly dear to me, um, and just ask them the same series of questions, you know, about their work and their life and how they balance everything. And it's so, it's at the end of the '70s, so they're kind of in this really incredible transition from hope and idealism into you know a lot of hard economic, um, social justice and health truths, not dissimilar to where we are now. Um, but the Tony K. Bambara interview there's a part where she says, um, you know, I mean, she's talking about what we're talking about. She's like, I can't always read reviews. I can't read what other people think about a work of art or an idea. I have to sit down for myself and figure out where do I, where am I situated in this thought? And the way she does it is a writing exercise. And so that's been really helpful for me. If I have a question for myself, well, I'll just try to write through it. Whereas mm -hmm. before I, I think I was approaching everything like it had to be an essay, it had to be published, it had to be a book proposal. Like I couldn't just write to write because my practice is so ingrained in this kind of commercial output. So it's been a big shift for me. And I, I mean, I hate journaling. Like I know I'm not supposed to say that, but my therapist is always like, try journaling. And I'll be like, I fucking hate journaling. And she's like, everybody hates it, but you still have to do it. So I see that also as separate from journaling, which is just like free associating, free thoughts. Yeah, yeah it's this other version feels a little bit more like play yeah hard also but sorry there was a lot of car but also when i think about you know you saying that you hate journaling but i also feel like that's what we do together in a lot of ways it's like you're sending me what's in your bag i'm sending you a picture of a color or the way the light is hitting something we're writing postcards where you know it's like there is in some ways, I guess I'm like, what is the difference between a journal and a record? Or, you know, like I, don't, I don't see those two things as dissimilar um, or as disparate, I guess, because it's so much of what's going on in our day and like mm -hmm. how we're reacting or how we are perceiving and living in the things that are happening around us and to us and that we're cultivating too. Um, but I do think that it, it feels really, yeah, I think it feels so important right now to, to give ourselves that freedom of, of being looser and of not being so, and just being gentler, I think. I, Cause I think I'm, I am, similar of like it has to be you know I'm definitely a type a creative and like it has to be this particular way or it has to be edited in a certain way and blah 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 and so I think that's why I also introduce different forms that I don't have so much control over into my own practice to like work myself out of the the ways that I might feel something 
um, the way I might treat something as a more rigid tool. And so giving myself different outs of like, you can't change this or, and that's what is great about it. Or you have to bring more chance into the way that you work and the people that you work with. And, mm -hmm. and so then it, it opens me up in a different way and it gives me a lot more freedom to, to constantly remind myself that I have that, I can do that all the time. Mm -hmm. And we can do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think is going to happen to our journals? Like, I, I mean, I keep all your letters, but I do, I don't know, you're really highlighting we have really kept, oh my gosh, it reminds me of when I was in middle school, I used to keep a composition notebook with my best friends and we would write letters to each other yeah. and pass it around. Oh, you did that too? Yeah. Where did you get that idea from? I don't know. And we would make, we would use um, binder paper. And then at the end, when we decided it was finished, we would like tie a little yarn bows around it or whatever but it was like I would have it one week then I would give it to Mary yes. and then Mary yes. would give it to Rachel and then I would get it back and then I would respond and, <laughs> yeah the original dms I mean I yeah <laughs> I remember that I remember that I think I I just brought a box of stuff back from my mom's house and I'm pretty sure that some of those notebooks are in there and I just can't wait to read the most embarrassing mundane <laughs> stuff but I do I do worry a lot about you know, these notebooks and I don't know where it goes. I feel like every time I, you know, change a laptop or change a phone, I'm just like crossing my fingers. Like I try to back everything up and keep it, but I don't, I don't know. And I think it's something, you know, I'm, I, this year before the pandemic, I was planning this big, you know, around the country tour with Wesley, who's my podcast co-host and I had been really excited because I was going to be able to go to universities that had archives that I wanted to spend time in, you know, and I wanted to read all these letters and like, you know, just sit with people's private thoughts or at least the private thoughts they were willing to leave in a, in a you know, they were allowed, they were willing to leave in an archive, but um, I don't know. It makes me really curious if that'll exist from this generation, you know, will there be, the thoughts of like, I don't know, all of Brie Newsom's tweets and like Kimberly Crenshaw and some of the people who I think, Raquel Willis, like some of the people who are writing some of the smartest commentary about right now, or I don't know. It's just interesting, like what happens to our exchanges? I guess we could make a book. We could put them in a little, <laughs> my eternal. We could make a book, but also I think the type of archiving you're talking about that might exist in a library is still the messiness of what we're doing right now in a way, you know, I think, yeah, there, I wouldn't want my tweets printed out and stored somewhere, you know, but there could, but there already is a digital imprint and there is a record of it somewhere, mm -hmm. but then I can also manipulate that record and I can delete things and I can, and it, I know it lives somewhere, but not anywhere that I can then see, you know? Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I've been thinking about archiving and right now I'm working on a kind of experimental prototype of the pursuit archive and thinking about what that looks like in a digital space and how to and bringing some of the the kind of the analog aspects of archiving that I love I love going to a place and looking through the boxes and not knowing exactly what document you're going to find or if you can find the document that you're looking for maybe now it's stored four pages behind that other piece of paper that you know and so just that idea the cataloging has to be so rigorous um and now we have so many we have such a large digital footprint and so i'm able to i'm thinking about bufu right now on the cloud that they that they made and and kind of things like that where the archive then becomes so much more expansive because of the digital footprint and because it can reach a lot more people or even just the way that we had to 
transition over the course of this year from doing in-person events to doing everything virtually and how had people come to talks or whatever that are all across the U.S. that wouldn't have been able to attend or would have never seen it in the first place. And so how True. their shift in accessibility and also there is, I'm still tied to the physical space of what an archive could be and could look like. And, and, you know, the act of sending a letter, the act of sending a postcard, that getting something in the mail, getting something physical, so getting something that you can, can hold still carries a lot of weight for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thinking about, okay, but that both those things can sit next to each other. And how do I then think about my own work in a way that provides a different type of access to the mm -hmm. to the material. Um, but it's been a fun exercise. And I think that it, I have to undo my own thinking about what an archive looks like too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So used to these like traditional academic models and also, but it's also really, you know, it's it's a power play too, because it's about, okay, well then who is holding onto the archive? What library is it in? And who's caretaking for it? And yeah. are they caretaking for it? And then you only have access if you have access to the institution. And so there's still this, so many boundaries that you have to cross to get access to the material that you might've never even knew that you needed to see. Yeah. Um, and I think about that a lot because when you told me to get Sister Love, that book of the letters between Pat Parker and Audre Lorde, that that just opened something up for me in a in a way that I wasn't expecting. And I and I think about it constantly in the way that it has informed a lot of what I've done in the past couple of years and the reason for, you know, wanting to make this archive and wanting to just think about the way that I make the archive and also the recognition of how important it is to keep a record of this moment and mm -hmm. of, of queer of queer people and trans people and non-binary people and just thinking about the people that were around in the community that we're in and how important it is to to preserve our stories right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about pursuit? for anybody that doesn't know what it is? Um, Pursuit exists right now as a deck of cards that features queer women, trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people. And it is a deck of cards that means so much to me, but it is truly a, a community project where um, I photographed about 105 people over nine days in 2018 and early 2019. And it was my first time doing an open call. Um, and I, I would say about 65% of the people in the deck are through that open call and who people who volunteered to participate. And I would say a huge chunk of people, about two thirds at least, I was meeting for the first time when they came to the studio. Um, and at the core of the project is really thinking about what queer life in Brooklyn, um, who is here with us. Um, and it's a range of so many different interesting people um, from musicians to chefs to students to two of my former students out for the project, which was really interesting and beautiful. And, um, yeah, the importance of documenting our lives and our experiences and also thinking about play and centering um, the ways that we are in community and how, you know, we are the ones keeping each other alive a lot of the time and how play and joy um, and laughter is so central to that. And, and so the deck um, is inspired by Catherine Opie's Dyke deck and which she made in um, 1995 in the Bay Area. And I really wanted to see 
to see the people that I see every day in an object like that and, you know, think about the form of a deck of cards, which is far more accessible than, say, buying a print of mine. It's like you have now 54 unique photographs in this deck that you can play with, that you can put in your pocket, that you can take around with you and it, and it functions what I really like is that it functions as both, you know, you think about a deck of cards that you can buy for $3 at a bodega and you also think about these photographs, which, you know, the, the bridging of kind of highbrow and lowbrow or fine art and craft or play and, and like the idea that it doesn't have to be just one thing and that we can exist in all of these different ways. And the form, so that's why the form of a, of a deck of cards was really, and is really exciting for me. And also as someone who reads tarot, it, it feels like, I didn't realize how important cards were to my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I have all these decks. I have this deck, this like Afro deck from 1970. I have a, you know, regular bicycle deck. I have just realizing that cards um, have been around me my whole life. Um, And it's something you can do alone and you can play a game of solitaire and it's something you can do in a big group and, and play with each other at the beach. And and that, and that it like just has taken on a life far beyond what I, I don't know what I dreamed. I didn't really like dream an outcome, but I, but I recognize that it has taken on a much wider life than I anticipated. And it was also community funded through Kickstarter. So truly, um, you know, there are a, about a thousand people who helped bring it to life, which feels really, really special. Mm-hmm. I love that deck. And, you know, I left you a note, a voice note after I visited, because you have a, a show up right now, Photografiska, which is always okay. a gallery name that I have to be careful to say slowly. It's at like 23rd and Park. Mm-hmm. And it's Park up- yeah. Yeah, but it's Park Avenue South, and it's up until? Up until February 28th, 2021. It just got extended. Oh, congrats. Yes. Thank you. Everyone should go see it. I mean, it's really incredible. I think I went to see it in the midst of, you know, the, I guess, towards the end of the summer when we're still very much dealing with um, all these uprisings in response to Black death and the negligence of Black life in this country. And, um I went at a moment when a lot of art was being made about or being talked about or being highlighted in a way about the death of black people and going to see, I've seen your work in many different spaces over the years, but there was something and I've been, (laughs) I know I always love seeing, I'm like, Hmm, which of my former lovers will be (laughs) on the wall this time? Will I be pictured with in this show? But, no, I, I think, but walking in at that period of time was like, you know, yeah, I'm familiar with your work, but I wasn't prepared for the visceral bodily reaction of, you know, being embraced by a body of work that celebrates people who are living and the beauty, right? Because pursuit in particular deals with joy and it deals with all the things you mentioned. And it also deals with the pleasure and just how beautiful everyone, everybody is. Like everybody came to those shoots just dressed and it really shows like there's just a richness and also in the way you make images, they're always so lush and very much in, in that beautiful Naima Green aesthetic. But I don't know, I just, I can't, I've been thinking about it a lot because, um, you know, when I went because it is pandemic, the tickets were timed. There really wasn't anybody else there. So it was just like, it was similar to the experience of something very hallowed and sacred, but it was the opposite of the end of the life and death spectrum, if that makes sense. So it was great to be in this like shrine to life, I guess. And I don't know, I can't get over it because it was just so precious. And it just occurs to me too, that um, the work felt like it was there just for the sake of it, not for publication necessarily, even though your work, you do work as a, you know, you do work in publications and you have an incredible body of work that's published all the time as well. But 
it was great to see something outside of this uptick of interest in black creatives and black life that's been in every news media, including my, my home base, the New York Times. But it just felt like being in someone's home and like, you know, in, in picturing us, Deb Willis talks a lot about how snapshots in the home and things, you know, in people's hallways and like going up the stairs and being on, on credenzas, that was where like the truest story of the brilliance and beauty of black life outside of all these hege hegemonic um, gazes existed. And you just kind of got these private glimpses. And I, I really felt that um, so present. And it reminded me too of something else I wanted to ask you, which is about privacy, you know, because something I love about your work is you do photograph all of us and you do photograph yourself in your own life, but it often feels really private. Like you're not getting, I think sometimes, especially with, with black women, like black femme figures, there's this desire for, for fullness and transparency. Like, let me see your whole face. Let me see everything. Let me see, you know, and I mean, I don't know. It's just rare that we ever get that mystery, you know, and that opacity that's not telling a story necessarily either, but it's just for the sake of, I don't know, maybe the subject or I, I wonder, I don't know. I think that's something I wanted to ask you about, which is how much you think about privacy as someone who makes work about something so intimate and, and personal. Mm. I will answer that question, but first I want to go back to <laughs> thinking about life and the body and what mm -hmm. you're working on right now and kind of thinking about your own life and your own your own relationship to your body. And I think mm -hmm. that that as a queer person, that is something that I, and I think a lot of people around me that we're thinking about often, whether it be, oh, am I safe in this environment? Or whether it be, oh, I feel so free in this environment. But I just wanna, I wanna think about with you and I wanna hear from you, um, you know, how, how your relationship in writing to, to the body and your body has, has shifted and expanded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it'll be really interesting to see how that evolves in a couple of years um, because, because so much of my writing practice has been rooted in journalism that has created a natural distance between me and the body um, my physical body and the body of that work. And so it's interesting because the project you're referring to that I'm working on, which sold recently this summer. So, you know, maybe it'll be out in two years. We'll see. But I, I do think it's deeply intimate and personal and I haven't really thought too much about what it'll feel like to have such intimate, um, anecdotes and just personal, stuff out there in the world. And I think there'll be enough time between now and then to figure it out, but it was really hard. I mean, I think even just going through the process of selling that work was really challenging because it is so, it's work I've kept so closely to my chest. And I think I tend to be a really private person. You know, I don't, the longer I'm on social media, the less personal details are on there. So I might share a lot quote, but not really, you know, it's very hard to know where I'm at or who I'm with. And I just feel, you know, I think that's been, there's been a shift in terms of the access I want to give. Like, I don't really want too many people to have access to that information. I think if you're in my life, then you know my life, but I don't really enjoy the feeling of other people um, creating a narrative. And I think I've just had way too many experiences of, of hearing those assumptions about myself in conversation or to me or projections to me. And because I do so much energy work too, I think there is like a psychic toll, a drain that I'm not aware of when someone is thinking I'm, I'm living a certain kind of life or I don't know, like they just have an expectation or an idea of an experience that is not really true, uh, but something that's been able to be cobbled together because of social media. So it's gonna be really different to go from that to actually laying out <laughs> these experiences 
that I want to archive in this book, but I think my hope is that I won't mind so much. I mean, we'll see, we'll see. But I've been really moved by when I talk about this nonfiction project, which is about dissociation. It's about the feeling of trying to figure out how to be in a body when you know you don't feel super safe inhabiting one, and all the machinations, machinations, and things you do to kind of. For me, that looked like pretending I didn't really have a body for a big chunk of my life, and it can look different ways for different people. But when I bring it up, a lot of people, especially if they're Black, especially if they're queer, can resonate. They really respond to it. And so the journalist inside of me is like, this has inherent value no matter what the personal cost is. And I think I feel that way no matter what. So even though, for example, um, over the summer, I went to Minneapolis for a story and this, the physical toll, I didn't get COVID or anything, but I was just really depleted and drained. And I basically only recovered a few weeks ago. And so from June until late August, there was just this, I was just in this terrible mindset because I was just so depressed and feeling hopeless, even as I was writing this story about the work it takes to try to change how we think about systems of policing in this country. It was just really exhausting and it exacted a lot of, of energy, but I felt like on the other side of it, it was worth it. So again, it's like that thing of like trusting the process and not knowing what the outcome will be, but feeling very much called to put my physical body in that type of service. So IDK girl, I mean, I hope it works out. We'll see. But I, I, ha I feel a lot of comfort that there's a lot of time to prepare. If this were something yeah. coming out in like a week, I'd be probably terrified. But I feel like I have a whole lot of time to. And this is a story that, that you are writing and, and have the, the control over too. And so it's like you could write something next week and then decide in a year, oh, actually, I don't want that anymore. I don't want that to go in anymore. I don't want that to, you know, that, that has changed for me or that shifted for me or that's no longer relevant to this to what I'm working on right now. Um, but I also am thinking about, this kind of also answers a little bit of your privacy question, but I was not in my own work for a really long time. I didn't start really sharing or really photographing myself until 2017. And some of the work that's in the show, that's in Brief and Drenching at Fotografiska is a large selection of self portraits. And so thinking about the way that I also relate to my own body and the way that I didn't want to share my body um, on social media, or I didn't want that to be the core of what my work was. And so, but then also when the show was finally installed and the museum could open, how much of a release and weight it was to be like, this is this is this is a part of me that I'm now sharing and giving to you, and I can let go of all of the I don't know all of the what I thought it needed to be or what I thought it needed to look like um, in the past, and so that was a deeply um, it was deeply. Freeing is a word, but it's not the word, but it, you know, it just, I was able to, there's a lightness now. And I feel like in this year, there have been a lot of just personal transitions where I've, where I've let go of a lot of things and had to do that with grace and feel like there is a letting go of so much and a stepping into so much more. And I can't name all of what that will be, but I, I see already, um, how much letting go has allowed for me to have a different kind of ease in my life um, in the past few months in particular. And that it, it part of that is because of the sharing and because I was holding so much close to the chest and because I was like, this is my personal life, you don't get that. Or this is my body, you don't get that. And now it's like, okay, but you, you, can, have, you can have it, you can have a little bit but I'm still controlling the way that you, what you're getting, you know, in a way that feels safe for me, in a way that feels good to me, in a way that feels, um, there is a still, there's still a deep intimacy, but 
I still can have so much and, and hold so much for myself, you know, and I can decide what is shared. And mm -hmm. so that is, it feels like an important reminder because it, I'm also sharing it on my own terms and I'm not, you know, there's not something that's like being released about me that I haven't consented to. It's like, I, I made this work, I was present and now I'm deciding that I'm ready to put it in context in the world that I'm living in or the world that I'm making or the world that my art exists in. Um, and that if it's like, okay, now it's time, like it's time to, to let this go and it's time to, to move on and allow, and allow me to go somewhere else in my own experiments, in my own process. And so that mm -hmm. is deeply thrilling and like such a relief, I think too. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I, I think it was there was a, an interesting experience too of like going to the show, brief and drenching, drenching, and like seeing myself there, but also not being totally recognizable in some ways. Like there were a couple images where, you know, I mean, I don't know. You have to know it's me to know it's me, you know. And I, I think. Okay. There was some there was some metaphor in that for me as well, which is to say that you know, even when you fully write out a thing, it's still a, a version, right? And like the people who know may know a little bit more, and the people who don't, I don't know. It's it it gave me a lot of calm and peace around the process that I'm going through, which is to say, it's just a version, or it's just a sliver mm -hmm. or a slice of a moment in time, and it's not. Yeah, it, it can it's only as revealing. Yeah, it's just an edit. It's just an edit, yeah. 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 And it's like, we keep editing and we keep revising and we and we become to get to a, a, that new place or that different place or the place that feels more true right now. And when I think about, I mean, cause we've now, I've, we've known each other for five years and we met through my photographing you and so it's like I've been photographing you for five years and to think and and I just got so excited I like lost all my words um because <laughs> what I love is like photographing people over time mm -hmm. because it's a deeper knowing but also such a reminder of how much we change and how different we are and how much we have the capability to change if we want to um yeah, and I think you're in the show at least three times, but not, yeah, not everyone will know that, you know? Um, I'm laughing because remember how you just found out my first name is different than, I have a different first name. <laughs> talk about mystery and you're asking me how I keep my privacy. I was appalled. I mean, it doesn't even occur to me that that's my name. It's, I've never been Jennifer. I've only, I've been Jenna since like the first grade, so. Yeah. It's so I, I, know. I just couldn't, I remember sending you that voice note and I was like, what is going on? Who is this person? I thought I knew you. I talked to you all the time. Like, yeah. Yeah. But there are things that you can keep for you, like your first name. Truly. Until five years into a relationship. <laughs> uh. Yeah, and that's really comforting that we, there's a train going by, um, that we can do that and we can let it go when we're ready. And also, sometimes we need people to help to push us a little bit, to nudge us a little bit to be ready, you know? And, I, and I'm and i grateful for those people in my life. And I think of, of Justine Curlin, who is one of my MFA faculty members and who is a friend now and how, you know, she just allowed gave space for me to move with a looseness and just be like, okay, this work is resolved. Like, let's talk about this stuff that's not perfect, that's not resolved, that's not, that doesn't feel complete to you because that's where there's so much to pull from. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I feel like I've been thinking a lot about myself in that way and different types of relationships that I'm in where it's like this, this might be a deep and long lasting relationship and it's not resolved and that's okay. And we can keep working at it and we can keep refining it and we can keep shifting um, to meet where we are and the needs of the moment too. And I think that's also what our friendship does for me in so many ways, because there'll be times where 
I'm talking to you every day and there'll be times where I don't see you for, you know, when I was in Mexico City, it was probably like six months or three months or, you know, a long time. Um, but that doesn't stop anything. And I, and I, and I realize that, and I've known this for a long time with a lot of my, my, dearest and closest friends that, you know, if I could not see you for five years, but when we pick up the, the Kiki is the same. And it's like, mm -hmm. we are, we are back. We're back together. Cause we're not really, the physical distance doesn't really mean we're apart, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's also what this time I, I hope is giving to a lot of people too. Um, that reminder that we can't physically be with the people we might want to be or need to be next to, but hopefully we're still getting that support or getting that, that like little light or that love or that hug or whatever um, in the ways that we're able to communicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that. I have felt that. I have felt the interactions I've had are so much more meaningful because they're so much more considered you know, there's so much more thought out versus just filling the time, which, I mean, that's not, that's not a kind way to say it, but I think sometimes living in New York, you can really stack social engagements just because like if someone has a desire to see you or you have a desire to see someone else, there's usually an attempt to, to meet that desire, fulfill it rather than like thinking about if it makes sense, if it's responsible, if it's what you want to be doing. And, and mm -hmm. so much moment has asked us for that thoughtfulness and intentionality which I live for so it's been really um it's been really incredible to yeah when you make you actually make that time it feels so much more meaningful because it is a huge risk that you're taking essentially mm -hmm. yeah and I'm remembering even when we used to talk about like oh I have to be on the city in this day so I'm just I'm doing like yeah. I'm filling my day with all of my eight city appointments so that I don't have to go back to the city, you know, yeah. and thinking about how now I hope that, and I am like willing and wanting for myself and for the people around me who need this to, to move with that same intentionality of, in everything where I'm like, Oh, actually I don't need to do that thing. Or I, don't want to do that thing that don't want to do something and listening to myself liberating Revelation. unreal i'm like i don't have to do like it. no i just don't want to and that's fine that's the answer yeah an unexpected gift but there nonetheless oh my gosh yeah Aww. well that feels like a really good note maybe to end things on. Is there anything else you wanted to add or anything else we didn't get to talk about that you wanted to bring up? No, I feel great about this conversation. I love talking to you always and oh. it will continue and, you know, in different forms, I'm sure. Cool. All right. Well, I'll see you on the internet and I'll send you a <laughs> later today, I'm sure. <laughs> Tell me about Buddy. I'll let you know what happens with me and Buddy. So it might just, Buddy might just become my actual Buddy and come back to New York with me. Just like living I feel like I, I can see both of those things happening. It's like it's eat with Buddy for dinner or butter be better. Buddy becomes a pet. <laughs> uh, I'll let you know. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.